Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bowser Carriga, and it's time once again for me to count down all the games I've beaten in the previous year. As always, there's a mix of games that released this year and older games. And any game I played a significant amount of that has no definitive ending, like MOBAs, or dare I say it, Battle Royales, are eligible for this list. So, with that out of the way, let's get to it. Ladies and gentlemen, here are all the games I beat in the year 2018. There always seems to be that big December game from the previous year I fall in love with that spills over to the coming year for me to beat. That game last year was Xenoblade Chronicles 2. If you don't know, I am a massive fan of the Xeno games. Their creator, Tetsuya Takahashi, is my favorite game developer. So, anytime a new game of his comes out, it's a pretty big deal for me. And Xenoblade 2 lived up to the hype for the most part. While I don't consider it as good as most other Xeno games, I still poured over a hundred hours into it with ease, and I regret none of it. The pseudo gacha system of Blades was addicting, the story kept me interested from beginning to end, the characters were overall likable, and the soundtrack was amazing. This was probably my first real big anticipated game on the Switch, and I was not disappointed. A lot of us were really iffy on Monster Hunter World before release. It seemed to change so much the classic Monster Hunter formula that fans have become accustomed to over the years, and we've all seen series that have fell off the rails trying to be different before. But thankfully in this case, change was good. Very, very good. Monster Hunter World is without a doubt the most ambitious, beginner friendly, and polished game the series has ever seen. I'll be honest, I did not care about the new story in the slightest. I just wanted to slay monsters. But it was nice that Capcom took the effort to actually try and give us a real story. Little quality of light changes like actual damage numbers and being able to fast travel all over the map made the game more enjoyable to play than ever before. And if I'm being honest, it's a bit hard to go back to older Monster Hunter games now because of it. While I pretty much put the game down when the story was over, I'm very much hoping the upcoming expansion can reel me right back in. Yep, it had to be on this list. The most popular game of 2018, bar none. Now, let's be real for a second. Most people hate Fortnite because it's popular and hating popular things is the cool thing to do. This has always happened with things that blow up in popularity overnight, like Undertale, Call of Duty, or Justin Bieber. But I'm here to tell you that I like Fortnite. It's a really fun game, especially with a group of friends. It doesn't take itself seriously like PUBG, and the building mechanics are simple, yet adds another entire layer to the gameplay. Some of my most hypest moments of 2018 were winning group games with my friends, and some of my funniest moments in gaming last year came from Fortnite. While I don't really see myself coming back to the game now, I don't regret any of the time I spent with it. This one is a bit special to me, since FF14 is the first MMO I've ever seriously delved into. I played probably about an hour of World of Warcraft, and I tried about 10 hours of Terra. But 14 is the first MMO that's truly made me want to keep coming back to it. It captures the soul of the Final Fantasy series in a way I didn't expect with its amazing musical score, abilities, and gorgeous cutscenes. I'm sure I've put over 100 hours into 14 easily, and I have no plans of slowing down anytime soon. As of this recording, I'm at the first expansion in Heaven's Ward, and I'm trying to get to Shadowbringers by the time it comes out this summer. There's many games that critics will call subpar, but fans will adore and put on a pedestal as a hidden gem that everyone should play. A game so loved by its dedicated fans that they will create a borderline cult following for it. Nier was a game heavily recommended to me that fell into this category of game. And unfortunately, it did not live up to the hype. I felt like I was waiting 20 hours for the game to get good, and then the credits rolled. The soundtrack was amazing, it was the deciding factor in making me want to play the game. But that's honestly the only good thing I can say about it. Subpar gameplay, characters the game tried to make me care about, and a supposedly mind-blowing plot twist I saw coming literally from the first battle. All these things just added up into an experience I walked away from feeling let down. It left such a bad taste in my mouth I'm hesitant to ever try the sequel.
For years, WWE has held the reins on wrestling itself, including the games. But the past couple years have seen explosive growth for other wrestling promotions, and Fire Pro Wrestling World feels like a byproduct of that. And I mean that in a good way. This game and its creation system allows you to essentially live out your wildest wrestling fantasies in the most ridiculous match types. You want Stone Cold Steve Austin vs. Ash Ketchum in an explosive barbed wire match? You can do that here, and it's addictive fun. One thing I must know, however, is that the controls of this game are unconventional. Well, in the average wrestling game, you press a button to kick, another to grapple, and press a direction with both of the aforementioned commands to do several moves. In this game, you simply get close to an opponent and you do moves, even without a button input. Now, it gets a bit more complicated than that, but it's still weird. I got used to it, though, and I love this little game and can't wait to see what comes of it through updates. Fire Pro Wrestling World was a great breath of fresh air, but WWE's games still have that budget and quality you just gotta love. And I'm glad to say 2K19 is the best game in the series in years. There's still many issues fans have had with the series with several iterations that aren't addressed, but they didn't detract from just how much fun I had with this entry. I expected the story mode to just be tacked on, but I actually had a lot of fun and it kept my interest. I'm hoping next year's game is even better. The third version of Pokemon games are usually pretty enjoyable and worth the purchase despite me putting hundreds of hours into the previous version. But there was just something about Ultra Sun that didn't suck me in, and I'm not even sure what. I've gone on record to say that Gen 7 is my favorite generation of Pokemon. I love how it breathed new life into the series with the islands and regional Alolan Pokemon, and I was initially excited to play Ultra Sun, but having to wait over 25 to 30 hours for all the new content to really start kicking in soured my mood. And by the time I was knee deep in the sad content, I still wasn't feeling motivated to play. So much so that I put this game down in 2017 and then pick it up for almost an entire year later. Which is why it's on this list and not last year's. Now, I don't regret buying and putting in the hours to beat Ultra Sun, but I will admit it wasn't the most enjoyable playthrough of Pokemon I've ever had. And as a massive Pokemon fan, that saddens me to say. RPGs are my favorite genre of game. I love going on an adventure with a party of misfits and saving the world. The old school ones especially are where I fell in love with the genre. Final Fantasies 1 through 6, Chrono Trigger, Lufia 2. The magic these games capture despite the limited hardware they ran on is something you don't see often the RPGs of today. So when I first played the demo of Octopath Traveler and experienced the beginning of Primrose's Story of Revenge, I knew it was a day one buy. Octopath is amazing. It's undoubtedly one of the most beautiful games I've ever played. I often would stop just to look at the scenery in an area, whether it's frozen fields where beautiful snow was falling, grasslands where the water in the lake sparkled like it was alive. Hell, even the sewer section of this game was gorgeous. I seriously walked in and thought, wow, this is a beautiful sewer. That's insane, and every single area is accompanied by a beautiful score of music, some of the best any RPG has to offer. Everything in Octopath was a reminder of what RPGs could and should be, and I can't wait to see more games done in this style. Before release, a lot of people were skeptical on Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, and I'll admit I was one of those people. Game Freak seemed to be taking many steps back and it made me uncomfortable. After playing Let's Go Pikachu to completion, I'll say that some of my fears were well founded, while some weren't. The removal of abilities and how items detracted from the experience, and I absolutely loathe the catching mechanics. Not to mention experience is skewed in a way that makes it so you get next to none from battling and a hilariously large amount from catching Pokemon over and over. There's even a gem where you can reach a screeching halt in your story progress if you haven't been catching many different Pokemon. But I'll admit Let's Go Pikachu did some good. Something I didn't think I was going to like but ended up loving was the fact that Pokemon appear in the overworld now. It definitely helps the game feel more alive. Just seeing these wild creatures roaming about in their natural habitats helped my immersion immensely and I really hope it becomes a series staple from now on. Also, it was nice not having to worry about random encounters for once. I played Gen 1 to death over the course of my life, at least 20 times. Let's Go Pikachu was a nice addition to my previous ventures through Kanto, but I don't see myself ever going through it again.
Super Robot Wars X is the first game in the series I took a break from and came back to at a later date in a long while, and I think that's a sign of my current grievances with the series. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm still a Super Robot Wars fanatic, but there's only so much reused assets in the same engine for a decade straight that I can stomach. But other than that, I had no issue with X. It was a great game, the original character of Mari and her story kept me interested from beginning to end, and what they did with the plots of some shows like Code Geass genuinely impressed me. With Super Robot Wars 2 on the horizon, another game reusing many assets and the same engine yet again, I'm looking forward to seeing if the series can continue to innovate itself, or if my fears as begun to stagnate are founded. I've made several attempts over the years to get into Final Fantasy Tactics. Probably over a decade ago I tried the PS1 version and it didn't click with me, so I stopped. A few years later I tried the World Alliance edition on PSP. I got a bit further but once again I just couldn't do it. And now in 2018 I finally made the decision to sit down and trudge through Final Fantasy Tactics. On paper it's a combination made in heaven for me, Final Fantasy and tactical gameplay. Two things I love. But, unfortunately, Final Fantasy Tactics just isn't for me. I can see and understand why many hold it in such high regard, but the slow, often frustrating gameplay mixed with a story that I feel could have been executed much better combined to make a game I beat and, well, didn't feel much of anything. I want to focus on that word I just used when describing this game's story. When I say it wasn't executed well, I should clarify that I thought the story and characters, or at least the villains, were good. Just the way that the story was told sort of fell on its face. I actually think this game would have made a compelling book. But like I said, I can recognize why so many love this game, and I don't regret playing through it despite the frustration some battles cause. It just didn't mesh with me. And that's a shame because I truly wanted to fall in love with this title. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate was my most anticipated game of the year and is without a doubt my game of 2018. What Masahiro Sakurai and his team put together here is truly the ultimate Smash Bros. experience. My first night with the game, playing into the wee hours of the morning with my friends where we discovered the little things about each character, slowly filled out our rosters, played together and just had a genuine good time, that night will go down as one of my favorite moments ever in gaming. The roster in Ultimate is ridiculously huge and I don't think I'll ever get bored since there's so many characters to rotate out and try when I get tired with one. Just the amount of content and the amount of polish on top of it all in this game is ludicrous and worthy of praise. I don't see how any future Smash game can compare, but I am so eager to find out. And that will do it for this year's video ladies and gentlemen. Once again another year of gaming has come to a close and with it another group of games tucking down. But I want to know what games you guys beat in 2018 or any thoughts you have on my list. Let me know down in the comment section below. Thank you guys so much for watching and as always, have a great day. Congrats on making it all the way to the end of the video. I hope you had as much fun watching as I did making it. If you want to see more of me, think about either subscribing or checking out more of my videos. If you want to make sure you never miss an upload, click the bell icon and join the notification squad. That way you'll always be notified whenever I upload something. A big thanks to all my patrons in the rookie tiers and up, West Hunt HD and Nightmare Alpha. Your continued support keeps the channel alive. And to all my other patrons on Patreon, thank you so much. It means a lot to me. If you want to become a patron on Patreon, just go to the description below and get started.